I'm Campbell Martin. I'm a journalist, but back in 2004, I was a member of this place, the Scottish Parliament. It was a very different time. We had a Labour-led Scottish Government in partnership with the Liberal Democrats under First Minister Jack McConnell. Labour also formed the UK Government. It was the time of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. The party had swept to power in a political landslide and, in what was portrayed as cool Britannia, suddenly a miraculous transformation began to affect towns and cities across the country. In virtually every part of the UK, Labour-run councils were building brand new schools. Health boards were constructing new hospitals. It seemed, on the face of it, that Labour had unearthed an economic miracle in the shape of a revamped private finance initiative. Renamed as public-private partnerships, the funding method allowed the Labour Party to deliver new facilities for local communities. But in the area I represented back in 2004, local people were not happy about plans to build a new school in Saltcoats. There was overwhelming opposition to Labour-run North Ayrshire Council's plan, which would see a new secondary school built on Lake Dykes playing fields, the only sports pitches serving the two towns of Saltcoats and Abrosson. As I joined local people attempting to save an area of grass, I had no idea what we were about to discover. Back in 2006, I had little idea either what a public-private partnership was, but along with others, I was about to find out. As a journalist, I had to get my head around this, and it, 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 it's really, uh, at its root level, quite simple, I think. It's uh, a method that successive governments have thought was a good idea of uh, getting private sector investments, money from private companies, to help fund public sector projects like schools and hospitals. Well, the private finance initiative or the public-private uh, partnership, as it was renamed, is a way in which the UK government decided to keep major capital projects off balance sheet so it didn't count against the national debt. A way of funding um, capital projects. So, in theory, one would think it might be a good idea, but the difficulty is that uh, the government and organisations like health boards and local government actually were taken advantage of by private companies with their own cooperation, uh, it has to be said. And so major projects were built at vastly extravagant uh, cost. Well, PFI and PPP for me is a huge drain on the public resources. Uh, the contracts came to light for me several years ago when local authorities were paying out huge amounts of money to service debts and service contracts for what seemed to be a very small amount of schools. And it caused us a huge amount of concern because we tried to track down where the money was going, who it was getting paid to, and we were getting very mixed answers. Uh, so the reality was for us, it just seemed to be initially a huge cost for uh, very few buildings. Well, I know the government's said at the time that it was a great scheme and value for money, but I think we know now that that's not really the case. Um, some people uh, on good evidence have described it as a, as a rip-off. Even today, with all the investigative tools we have at our disposal, the secrecy surrounding the public finance initiative and public-private partnerships makes it very difficult to put an exact figure on just how much of a rip-off the whole thing has been for the public purse. A UK Treasury document published in December 2016 lists the total value of active PFIs and PPPs in Scotland as being £5.6 billion. But the Treasury figure doesn't paint the full financial picture, far from it. The figure of £5.6 billion represents only the cost of actually building new schools and hospitals. Using PFIs or PPPs means councils and health boards sign up to long-term contracts where the private companies who built the schools and hospitals are also paid to maintain them, usually for 30 years. This means that while the Treasury figure puts the cost of Scotland's PFIs and PPPs at £5.6 billion, independent economists have calculated the true cost is actually around £36 billion. Of that figure, £21 billion is still to be paid by councils and health boards, which of course actually means £21 billion has still to be paid by Scottish taxpayers. This is money going from the public purse into the bank accounts of private companies and international financial organisations. 
it would have been easier and cheaper to have borrowed from the public sector rather than the private sector. But for some way, you know, in the sort of economic, political climate of the time, um, you know, neoliberal economic values, uh, public sector was seen as bad and private sector was seen as good. Private sector were able to sell their skills, said they could do these things quicker, more efficiently, and so on. And that became the accepted uh, ideology, the accepted belief of the day. And of course, they were introduced originally by the Conservative government and then taken on by the, the Labour government in the UK, uh, 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 who who both found them a convenient way, or, or thought they'd be a convenient way, to, to, to get credit for building lots of schools and hospitals. Um, in retrospect, it doesn't look so good. This is St Matthew's Academy in Solcoats. It's one of four schools built by North Ayrshire Council using a public-private partnership. It was also the school local people objected to because it was built on public football pitches at Lake Dykes playing fields. Back in 2004, John Hunter was one of the locals who formed the Lake Dykes residence group to fight North Ayrshire Council's plans. Where I'm sitting right now, about 300 yards behind me, are the playing fields. So it was on my doorstep as well, so to speak. I had no problem with St Andrews getting a new school, none at all. Uh, not indeed anybody else getting new schools or hospitals. My main opposition to this was based on, not ideology, but based on whether the public were going to get ripped off. I had been the chair of Solcoats Community Council and uh, for about 18 months or so, and people approached me to ask me if I would head up a, a focus group or a pressure group uh, against building anything gigantic in the playing fields. A direct replacement for St Andrews would have been no problem whatsoever. Nobody objected to that. When the extent of the rebuild became apparent, and it was a merger of two schools, St Michael's and Kawanning uh, and St Andrews and Solcoats, that would have required a, a very, very large replacement. Another local man, Ronnie McNichol, also decided to get involved. I became involved with Leydyke's residence group after a parent approached me uh, to say that North Ayrshire Council were going to build four new schools under the PPP contract and we were going to lose the open space green plainfield land at Lake Dykes. The Lake Dykes residence group became a very effective campaigning organisation, taking protests directly to the headquarters of North Ayrshire Council and organising a public march through Solcoats, which culminated in a rally at Lake Dykes playing fields. So strong was the public backing for the Lake Dykes campaign, Ronnie McNichol and John Hunter were both subsequently elected as independent councillors on North Ayrshire Council. However, despite the efforts of the Lake Dykes Residence Group and almost total opposition from local people, North Ayrshire Council proceeded with its plans to build four new schools. In July 2006, the Chief Executive of the Council signed a contract with First Class Consortium, a group of private sector companies, which committed the Council to pay £80 million for the construction of the four schools and a further £300 million to maintain the facilities over the next 30 years. The total value of the contract signed by North Ayrshire Council was therefore £380 million. The schools were built, including St Matthew's Academy on Lake Dykes playing fields, and the maintenance contract kicked in. Quickly, it became clear just how paying for these four new schools was impacting on the total funding available to North Ayrshire Council. And this was a story repeated in every local authority that had embarked on building new facilities using PFIs or PPPs. When uh, we're going through budget proposals for councils, uh, unfortunately now a huge amount of money is taken up servicing these contracts and these debts. So from there the knock-on effect is, is that there is less money available for services and that's of real concern because then it has an impact on jobs and it uh, has an impact right across the, the local authority. So from there, we're really, really concerned about the levels of debt that, uh, the levels of payments that are being made and they're increasing year upon year. The 
impact on jobs and services has been quite significant. The budget of North Ayrshire Council and the financial year that's about to begin will be about £303 million. But about £13 million of that currently is going to service this uh, PFI PPP debt. Now that's increased year on year since uh, 2007-8 from £11.1 million and will continue to increase to £16.7 million by 2037-38. So it's impacting more and more on jobs and services every single year at a time of a great financial challenge. In councils across the length and breadth of Scotland, jobs have been lost, services have been cut and some have completely stopped as a result of local authorities having to pay PFI PPP bills. Written into the contracts signed by councils is that these debts take precedence over every other function. Local authorities must pay private companies behind their PFI PPP schools before they deliver any services to local taxpayers. In North Ayrshire, currently, the council must pay just over £1 million every month to its PPP provider. That's £1 million every month before the council can start delivering housing, education, social work and the many other services needed by communities in an area that has one of Scotland's highest levels of poverty and unemployment. It's definitely not best value for the public purse. It's about uh, profit for private companies. The decision to embark on a multi-million pound schools construction project in North Ayrshire was taken following a procurement exercise governed by strict European Union procurement regulations. In addition, North Ayrshire Council's actions were overseen by the then Scottish Government's Financial Partnerships Unit, which, in turn, was scrutinised by Partnerships UK, a body established out of the UK Treasury at Westminster. With such stringent oversight, the public would be forgiven for believing everything had to be above board and that the PPP contract awarded by North Ayrshire Council represented value for money for the public purse. But scratch the surface of North Ayrshire Council's school's PPP project and some shocking facts begin to emerge. The European Union procurement regulations, which governed how PFI PPP contracts were run, stipulated that procuring agencies, that's councils and health boards, must be able to show there was genuine competition for each contract. There had to be genuine competition to ensure councils and health boards got the best value for taxpayers. So let's take a closer look at the North Ayrshire Council Schools PPP project. We've already seen that the £380 million contract to build four schools was awarded to First Class Consortium. This was a group of companies led initially by the German construction company Hochtief. During the procurement process for the contract, North Ayrshire Council had just one other bid from a Fife-based company called Comprehensive Estate Services Limited. Despite there being only two bids for the contract, fewer than EU procurement regulations stated should be secured for a contract of this size and value, North Ayrshire Council argued that genuine competition had been achieved and that the local authority had secured value for money for the North Ayrshire taxpayers. Closer examination, however, suggests this was not the case. Having viewed bid documents we secured under freedom of information legislation, very serious questions began to emerge over the standing of Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, CES, the company that North Ayrshire Council claimed had provided genuine competition for its £380 million contract. The Council argued CES had been a credible and viable bidder, pushing First Class Consortium to deliver a best value price to build four new schools. Once again though, closer examination shows that, far from being a credible and viable bidder to secure a £380 million construction contract, Comprehensive Estate Services Limited was actually a recently formed company with no office of its own. The headquarters address it gave in bid documents was actually the office of a chartered accountant in the Fife village of Strathmiglo. The chartered accountant in question told us he simply allowed Comprehensive Estate Services to use his office as a postal address. Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, as a newly formed company, had no accounts and had issued share capital valued at just £2. The company also had no experience of building or maintaining schools. Again, in documents secured by us under freedom of information legislation, it's revealed that 
In the first key stage review of North Ayrshire Council's procurement process, the local authority's own advisors said of Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, the findings of the evaluation indicate that, based on the information provided, only one bid is capable of progressing to the ITN invitation to negotiate stage of the procurement. The advisors indicated the one bidder capable of progressing to the next stage was First Class Consortium. With regard to the only other bid received, the key stage review stated, the Council's financial advisors have been unable to satisfy themselves that the Comprehensive Estates Limited CES bid has sufficient financial or economic standing necessary to pass the evaluation at this stage of the process. So, at the very first key stage review of the procurement process, North Ayrshire Council was told by its own advisors that Comprehensive Estate Services Limited did not have sufficient standing to remain in the bidding process. But later in the same document, the Council's advisors recorded that, having considered a range of options, including the exclusion of Comprehensive Estate Services and proceeding with just one bid, the Council decided that while CES fail the evaluation criteria set out in this document, they may be permitted to proceed to ITN. Despite being told by their own advisors that Comprehensive Services, Comprehensive State Services Limited failed to pass the first key stage review, North Ayrshire Council allowed the company to remain as one of only two bids received for its PPP schools project. At this point, we need to take a closer look at the bid documents submitted to North Ayrshire Council by Comprehensive Estate Services. We secured these documents under freedom of information legislation. Initially though, North Ayrshire Council refused to release the documents, but we appealed their decision to the Scottish Information Commissioner, who found in our favour. One key issue immediately stood out when we reviewed the paperwork submitted by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited. The Fife-based company claimed in its bid submission that it was a subsidiary of a Singapore headquartered construction company, CPG Corporation. North Ayrshire Council repeatedly stated publicly that as a subsidiary of CPG Corporation, CES had years of experience in building and maintaining schools in Singapore. The Comprehensive Estate Services bid documents also claimed that CPG Corporation held a majority shareholding in CES at 56%. However, back in 2006, during North Ayrshire Council's procurement process, we contacted Mr. Pang To Kang, President and Chief Executive Officer of CPG Corporation. In response, Mr. Pang stated, Comprehensive Estate Services, CES, is not a subsidiary of CPG Corporation. There is no cross shareholdings between CPG Corporation and CES. There can be no misinterpretation of what Mr. Pang said. Despite bid documents from Comprehensive Estate Services claiming CES was a subsidiary of CPG Corporation and that CPG Corporation held 56% of shares in CES, the Singapore company stated unequivocally, Comprehensive Estate Services is not a subsidiary of CPG Corporation and that there was no cross shareholdings between the two companies. The claim by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited in the documents it submitted as part of its bid was clearly a lie. At the time, we told North Ayrshire Council of the response we had received from Mr Pang of CPG Corporation. The Council took no action. So, we have North Ayrshire Council's own advisors telling the Council that Comprehensive Estate Services Limited did not have sufficient standing to progress beyond the first key stage review of its procurement process and we told the local authority that the CES claim to be a subsidiary of CP CPG Corporation was a lie, but North Ayrshire Council still publicly argued that the bid from Comprehensive Estate Services Limited was credible and viable, and provided the legal requirement of genuine competition to the only other bid it had received, the one from First Class Consortium. Elsewhere in the bid documents submitted by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, the company listed three referees whom it claimed would vouch for the competency of CES. We contacted all three of the referees listed by CES. All three responded, 
indicating they had not agreed to be referees for Comprehensive Estate Services Limited. None of the referees had ever heard of CES. Again, we drew this further lie to the attention of North Ayrshire Council. Again though, the local authority took no action and continued to publicly state that the bid from Comprehensive Estate Services represented genuine competition. These are copies of the actual bid documents submitted by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited. As previously stated, we secured these documents from North Ayrshire Council under Freedom of Information legislation after the local authority had initially refused to release them. We have already established that the claim by Comprehensive Estate Services that it was a subsidiary of CPG Corporation was a lie and that North Ayrshire Council had been made aware of this, but as can be seen, Virtually every page of the CES bid relates to the business activities and company structure of CPG Corporation. Crucially, in order to qualify as a competent bidder under EU procurement regulations, a company must provide valid insurance documents relating to various aspects of the bid. These are copies of the actual insurance documents submitted by Comprehensive Estate Services to support its bid for the North Ayrshire contract. All of them are actually insurance documents downloaded from the website of CPG Corporation. All of them relate to the Singapore company. None of them even mention Comprehensive Estate Services. In fact, most of them were issued prior to the date that Comprehensive Estate Services was incorporated as a company, and most were already out of date when they were submitted to North Ayrshire Council. Again, this information was brought to the attention of North Ayrshire Council. Again, the local authority took no action and continued to claim the bid from Comprehensive Estate Services was credible and viable and provided the legally required genuine competition to the one received from First Class Consortium. It became clear that North Asia Council was not prepared to take any action over the very serious issues raised with them regarding the bid submitted by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited. Even though these matters seemed to show there was no genuine competition, no competition at all for its multi-million pound schools PPP contract. At this point in our investigation, I, along with Ronnie McNichol of the Lake Dykes Residence Group, met with the Area Procurator Fiscal at Kilmarnock. We presented him with all the information we had regarding Comprehensive Estate Services and the lies contained in its bid documents. The Fiscal instructed the then Strathclyde Police to carry out an investigation into the matter. But, less than two weeks after the police were told to look into the issues, the Irvin Herald newspaper ran with a front page scoop headlined, Fraud Cops Drop Probe. Without either me or Ronnie McNichol having been spoken to by the police, the fraud squad had apparently concluded its investigation and found there was no evidence of criminality. The investigation was dropped. Following this, Ronnie McNichol and I arranged a second meeting with the Area Procurator Fiscal. We wanted to know how an investigation could have been carried out in less than two weeks, and why neither of us as the complainers had been interviewed. We were simply told, again, that the police had concluded their investigation and found there was no evidence of criminality. We were also told that Crown Council agreed, so the matter was closed. But at this meeting we had more evidence not previously disclosed to the Fiscal or Police. It was in a box file, like this, and I presented it to the area Fiscal. With one finger, the Fiscal pushed the box back across the table to me and said, it's more than my jaw's worth to reopen this case. He hadn't even looked at the contents of the box file. Now, I have no record of the Fiscal's comments that day, but the phrase, it's more than my jaw's worth to reopen this case, is exactly how both Ronnie McNichol and I remember the Fiscal's comments. So, until recently, that's how matters ended. Despite all of the evidence, including blatant lies, despite bid documents that related to a company not even involved in the procurement process, despite invalid insurance documents, despite referees stating they had nothing to do with the company, that had preferred their names, despite CPG Corporation stating unequivocally that Comprehensive Estate Services Limited 
was not a subsidiary of CPG, North Ayrshire Council proceeded to award the contract valued at the time at £380 million. The contract went to First Class Consortium, but if North Ayrshire Council had not allowed the bid from Comprehensive Estate Services to remain until the very end, then there would have been only one bid for the contract. This would have meant the Council had no competition, none whatsoever, for its PPP contract. Recently, we once again collected together all of the evidence originally presented to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and Strathclyde Police back in 2006. We spoke with two former senior detectives. Both former officers were shown and reviewed the original evidence submitted in 2006 to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and Strathclyde Police. These were the same documents that the Fiscal and Police found showed no evidence of criminality. One of the officers, a former member of the Strathclyde Police Fraud Squad, agreed to speak to us on condition of anonymity. Based on the information and paperwork available in 2006, I would have expected the inquiry officer to initially focus attention on the common law crime of forgery and uttering. It's clear from the documents I was shown that the company incorporated as Comprehensive Estate Services Limited uh, entered the tendering process in line with the procurement regulations in order to obtain the contract to construct four school buildings at various locations in North Ayrshire. In doing so, the, the company submitted documentation to North Ayrshire Council detailing their qualifications to undertake this type of construction. Um, the inquiry officer would be expected to make inquiries of the officials from North Ayrshire Council to establish which route they took uh, with the procurement process and how the tender bids were received and progressed. Uh, in, in any case, the documentation I was shown clearly indicates that someone from Comprehensive Estate Services Limited had deliberately forged, copied, altered uh, and inserted false information on their application prior to uttering the document to North Ayrshire Council as genuine. Um, much of the information accompanying the application appears to be from the website of the CPG Corporation, which was based in Singapore. The, the, documentation, uh, the documentation purports to show Comprehensive Estate Services Limited as a subsidiary of CPG Corporation uh, and further documentation and letters from three alleged referees are designed to support the bid, but confirmation from all three referees now shows they had no knowledge of the company Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, uh, nor did any of them provide permission to use their individual names or business references in such an application. The forged document submitted to North Ayrshire Council was a clear and deliberate attempt by Comprehensive Estate Services Limited to win all or part of the construction contract and thereby to gain financially or, or enhance their reputation in the construction business. As such, a common law crime of forgery and uttering should have been investigated and the principles of the company should have been traced and interviewed under caution. John Salins' police career saw him serve with the Metropolitan Police, Strathclyde Police and Police Scotland. Mr Salins, a detective sergeant, investigated some of Scotland's most high-profile crimes, including the 2007 terrorist attack on Glasgow Airport. He received three police commendations for his work. Would it be normal in any investigation not to interview the people who had lodged the complaint? <laughs> Absolutely not. They're the first people to be interviewed, uh, having made the complaint, uh, known as a complainer. Uh, there should have been lengthy statements taken from them and the investigation is based on what they say uh, and, and obviously uh, this being a complex investigation uh, the, the individuals making a complaint should have been uh, spoken to at length and statements obtained from them. Well, uh, as you know, I was one of the people who lodged the complaints mm -hmm. at that time and I was never spoken to at all. Uh, I can't understand that at all. I have no idea why that happened but you how, should have been spoken to. How, how could it have been possible? to carry out an investigation into allegations made by me and, and another individual um, without even talking to us. That's it's just not feasible. It's impossible. I mean, I don't, I don't know the reasoning for doing so, but that, that is not an investigation. To me, there's something in the background there. You should certainly have been spoken to at early stages. You should have been initial people that should have been spoken to by the police 
And as I say, is anything uh, that you just said should have been looked into uh, and investigated properly. Uh, any individual making a complaint, that's the first port of call in any inquiry. You speak to the complainer, you obtain a full statement from them, and then you base your inquiry on that. And again, that never happened. No, it never happened to yourself, I understand that. Okay, if we, if we move on to um, Comprehensive Estate Services, mm -hmm. which was the company that submitted the, the second bid, um, supposedly a, a, a legitimate bid for a £380 million contract. Um, Comprehensive Estate Services actually wasn't formed until after the council put out the invitation to tender for this uh, multi-million pound contract. They had no accounts, they had no office, they had uh, paid up share capital value at just two pounds, uh, but they were bidding for a £380 million pound contract to build four schools. Um, and documents submitted to North Eastern Council as part of the Comprehensive Estate Services bid, the company claimed to be a subsidiary of a, a major Singapore-based construction company, uh, CPG Corporation. They claimed that in, in paperwork submitted to North Eastern Council that CPG Corporation owned 56% of comprehensive estate services. So they said that um, CES was a, a subsidiary of uh, the, the Singapore-based company and that the, the Singapore-based company was the major shareholder. Um, but the chief executive of um, CPG Corporation wrote to me when I asked him about this and he said, and I quote again, CES is not a subsidiary of CPG Corporation and added, there is no cross shareholdings between CPG Corporation and CES. What do you think of that? That's obviously the uh, council an out and out lie. I mean, they've got to call into question integrity. Uh, of the whole situation here. I mean, that company's saying I've never heard of uh, CSS, 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 Comprehensive State Services. Services. So again, and again, their integrity has got to be called into question. It's an out and out lie. Surely there, there must be a law against uh, a company submitting a bid for a multi million pound contract and telling a blatant lie in, in the paperwork they submitted. Surely, surely that's what they have a police investigation in its own. It's a criminal offence. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's a fraud. And they're making a fraudulent claim. They're saying they're part of something they are not in order to obtain a contract. And yet, there was no evidence of criminality. As I said, I alluded to earlier, I've had a look through this and the, the whole the whole scenario uh, is full of criminality from start to finish. So could an investigation, a police investigation, have been carried out without even speaking to the directors of Comprehensive Estate Services? Absolutely not. Again, as I said earlier, the complainer should have been spoken to, uh, the, the, the directors of the Comprehensive Estate Services should have been spoken to, but there's numerous other people that should have been spoken to to carry out a further investigation into the complaint that was made. But it's quite evident that this hasn't happened. Between the, the Procurator Fiscal instructing Strathclyde Police to carry out an inquiry and a local newspaper reporting the inquiry had concluded with the, the headline Fraud Cops Drop Probe. Um, less than two weeks had expired. Is, is it possible to carry out an investigation of this nature in less than two weeks? It's absolutely impossible. I mean, in a, in a newspaper reporting that the inquiry is concluded, uh, I mean, this, this inquiry is very complex by its nature. Two weeks wouldn't even look at this. I mean, they wouldn't even look into the background work that would have to be carried out before the inquiry and the investigation earnest kicked off. Two, I, I have no idea. that I, They've closed that very quickly, but there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's been no investigation carried out whatsoever. Absolutely not. Leading on from, from what you just said there, I mean, um, you've reviewed some of the evidence that was presented mm -hmm. to the Procurator Fiscal and, and to the police. Um, based on what you've seen, do you think there are any grounds for the Procurator Fiscal to conclude that there was no evidence of criminality? Absolutely not. I mean, it just means even a, a young police officer looking at this would, would, would clearly see that there's cl a criminality uh, from start to finish. I mean, we've got companies here saying that other companies have got no part of it. We've got uh, divisional commanders contacting the executive, contacting the fiscal. We've got officers saying that they're, they're, they're friendly uh, with people that are under investigation. It, it just, it's absolutely full of criminality. 
And there's various aspects of this whole complex inquiry that are a separate criminal matter aside, apart from just the bidding for these contracts. I suppose just finally, and um, as a, a core question to the whole thing here, um, from what you've seen and, and the evidence and, and what you know about this case, do you think everything's above board? Absolutely not. This is completely underhanded what's going on here. Uh, this really does need a further investigation reopened and examined again and investigated correctly. Something seriously underhand has happened here. Uh, we, we, we phantom contracts and et cetera, et cetera, and withholding information. As I said, no transparency, no accountability, collusion between the individuals. It just, it just stinks, a complete cover-up. Uh, I don't know what the agenda is, but there's something that seriously needs investigated. The evidence is clear, just as clear now as it was back in 2006. So the question that has to be asked is, who had the power to order that no police investigation should be carried out? Who had sufficient power that led a procurator fiscal to say it was more than his job was worth to reopen the case? Who had power over the then Scottish Government's Financial Partnerships Unit? Who had such power that North Ayrshire Council, Strathclyde Police, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and the Central Government Civil Service in Scotland would allow this matter to be covered up? In this programme, we had hoped to provide answers to those questions. We asked North Ayrshire Council to provide a spokesperson for interview. The Council declined. We also asked David O'Neill, the Labour leader of North Ayrshire Council during its PPP procurement process. Mr O'Neill declined to be interviewed. We asked the Confederation of Scottish Local Authorities to be interviewed. A spokesperson declined. We asked Mr Andrew Caskey to be interviewed for this programme. Mr Caskey was the Scottish Government civil servant who provided guidance and instruction to North Ayrshire Council during the procurement of its school's PPP project. Mr Caskey replied, Out of respect for my former employers, I'm afraid that I would not be prepared to discuss my work at the time. We asked the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service to provide a representative for interview. They declined. We asked Police Scotland to be interviewed for this programme. The police replied, we will not provide a spokesperson for an on-camera interview for your documentary. In addition, the force representative referred to the supposed police inquiry of 2006 into the North Ayrshire Council Schools PPP project, stating, we cannot confirm whether or not a police investigation was carried out. We also tried to contact Mr Richard Navrot, the Principal Director of Comprehensive Estate Services Limited, Mr Navrot has no publicly available residential address. He disappeared from the electoral register in Fife in 2012. The only publicly available address for Mr Navrot is the one provided by him to Companies House in relation to a current company of which he is the sole director. We wrote to Mr Navrot at that address, inviting him to be interviewed for this programme. Royal Mail was unable to deliver the letter because no one at the address would sign for it. The evidence of potential criminality in this matter is overwhelming. Back in 2006, North Ayrshire Council claimed it had two credible and viable bids for its multi-million pound schools PPP project. In reality, it had only one such bid. There was no competition for a contract now costing North Ayrshire taxpayers one million pounds every month. Despite claims to the contrary in 2006, there is now serious doubt as to whether or not the police carried out an investigation into the evidence supplied to it and, of course, the Procurator Fiscal felt it was more than his job was worth to reopen the case. All these years later, every organisation involved in the North Ayrshire Schools PPP project and the supposed subsequent investigation still refuses to talk about it. So, again, the question is, who has the power to close down police investigations? Who has the power to control decisions of the Crown Office? Who has the power to smooth the way for local authorities when legally binding EU procurement regulations are being flouted? Well, what we do know is that the UK Labour government led by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown oversaw a massive expansion of PFI PPP deals. Under the Blair-Brown government, councils and health boards were told there was only one game in town. If they wanted to build new schools or hospitals, 
they had to use PFI PPP. Everything was done to achieve the short-term goal of making sure schools and hospitals were built, whatever the long-term cost. It seems all that mattered was Labour politicians could go into the next elections claiming to have performed an economic miracle and delivered new facilities for local communities. Meanwhile, the debt run up by mainly Labour councils remains to be paid by us, our children and our grandchildren. PFI PPP, the only game in town, has left taxpayers with an ongoing current bill of around £21 billion, mainly for schools that are worth only a fraction of that cost. The passage of time is likely to show that PFI PPP is one of the biggest ever rip-offs of public money, our money. In North Ayrshire, it's not too late for the Procurator Fiscal and Police to do what is right and carry out the investigation that should have been conducted back in 2006. Given the facts we have revealed in this programme, the cover-up has been blown.